I got really sick really fast. And my choice to love someone and elevate them is all the more impactful. But we aren't all getting kicked out of college. Housing probation, chapel probation, the trickiest lies are when there is good truth mixed in. It's just like, hit me, do I want to be healed? You say you're desperate, but you're doing all the same things every day. If you're actually desperate, do something desperate. But that's not where the worship is. The worship is in the process, the process. Hello friends, episode three of the I Used to Think podcast is finally here. A podcast about the stories of people who are brave enough to change their mind. Today, I have a conversation with Eric, who is a good friend of mine and happens to be my former high school English teacher. Eric tells the story of a mysterious illness that he had for over 10 years and how that shaped his personality, his relationship with others, and his relationship with himself. He also talks about a lot of literature influences that have shaped who he is today. A little context, Western Christian is the high school that he taught at, which I also attended, located in Upland, California. The university he attended very briefly is Azusa Pacific University, located in Azusa, California. Today, Eric works as a freelance writer and editor. If any of you are interested in reaching out to him, feel free to let me know. And with that being said, let's start the show. Excited to have a conversation with a friend. And I'm excited that maybe someone... I'm excited to become famous, essentially. <laughs> I think you'd think too highly of this podcast. It's uh... it's impossible. <laughs> let's get going. Um, okay. We're here with Eric, my former English teacher. I would say one of my earliest mentors. And... You just said I was a friend, so I was going to say that I'm hopefully a friend, but now that's been that's been confirmed, which I'm very happy about and thankful for. Well, you call me Eric instead of Mr. Nelson, so that's a big step. So yes, you've entered the sacred place of friendship. Well done. Although that, that happened starting probably junior year of, of high school for me. But... Oh, well, it took me a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> to, to really yeah. accept it. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, we'll start with the icebreaker. I really thought hard about this one, being the introspective, deep person that you are. I wanted something that you could really, really flesh out. What three foods would you choose if you were in a food fight to the death? A food fight to the death. So food poisoning's a little too slow. <laughs> I don't even know how you would do. Yeah, do, right. injection? I'd have to throw it, yeah, into their <laughs> mouth and then wait a while. Hmm. It, can the food still be alive? Uh, I don't think that's considered food. Okay. Well, if you ask a cannibal, <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to say no. Okay. I guess I'm the host, so I get to say no. Pineapple. I think pineapple first. Okay. Because, like, that's, like, a really good projectile. Uh-huh. Like, a, like, starting it off. But once you get in close, what are you, what are you going to want to have? Yeah, some close combat foods. Could it be like a whole swordfish? If you could swing that around, yeah. You, got, you hold <laughs> it and like like a, a battering ram spear? Uh-huh. Oh, and then you just need dessert. <laughs> <laughs> so a scoop of ice cream. <laughs> to suffocate them at the end? No, just for me. Oh, that's... I, I've already won. <laughs> The pineapple is distraction. I charge in with the swordfish spear, and uh, the ice cream's for me. Wow, that's that's a lot of confidence right there, because you're not even you're not even using that third one as a weapon. No, no. Wow. You gotta enjoy, like, you gotta enjoy the finer things, such as food fights to the death. Okay. If there's anything I've learned from this conversation, it's don't mess with Eric in a food fight to the death. That's a good idea. All right. Well, this is it. What is your I used to think statement? I used to think that I didn't matter. And now I know that I matter a lot. And the more value I allow myself to have, the more I can love everyone. The more I can love the people I need to love, Mm. which is everyone. Yeah. I think I'll start just from when I initially texted you 
because when you first came to my mind for this podcast, it was because you so vulnerably and honestly shared with us um, your first year as a teacher, your story um, with your health and your faith was deeply involved in that, obviously. Uh, Maybe summarize for us all that went down during those years. Sure. Um, It's a story that I've been lucky enough to tell many times. I've told it to every high school class I've I've had um, for hope, for the sake of hope. I think that's why I was given that story. So when I was um, 12, I got really sick. Um, And up until that point, I had had a very simple life. Um, Upper middle class, upbringing, um, stability. Um, But I got really sick really fast. So like the kind of sick where you throw up 10 times a day, um, every day. And I was in the hospital constantly. I, was, I I mean I halfway it was January second and, and in the middle of a school year and I went like my life just changed overnight and mm. I went from popular outgoing um, to I, I got I got weird honestly I got weird really fast I lost a lot of weight I looked sickly I stopped I I forgot how to how to interact with people. And, but I, you know, I was okay. Like I had good health care. Um, I had good doctors. Um, I had supportive parents. And so uh, seventh, the rest of seventh grade was okay. What was the diagnosis? Uh, there was never a diagnosis. Really? I don't um, think I knew this. They, I mean, they, they tried. <laughs> so here's the thing. They tried diagnosing me uh-huh. many times. Um, doctors have, a, I mean, everyone has a hard time saying, I don't know doctors have an especially hard time saying I don't know and so I had doctors who would say oh I know it's this Mm -hmm. Um, I think my favorite one of those was when I was in 8th grade and a doctor said oh I know the problem is that your brain is producing too much of a certain kind of chemical and they prescribed me lithium I don't know if you know what lithium does is that in batteries? Uh, it is in batteries, okay, um, but it's it also used as an antipsychotic. Um, I took it once, mm-hmm. and then I I was I stopped existing for like three days because I was not psychotic. Um, so, wow, yes, um, I I had many tests. I had I mean I, honestly all I can say is that the health care I, I received only gave me worse side effects than what I was already going through. And I had really, uh, I had really rough teachers who were kind of like, well, if you can't show up to school, you don't get to pass. And so I'd, I'd like go to the doctors for like a couple periods and then go to school and then like throw up in between class. I mean, it was, like being a junior higher is like already terrible. Oh yeah. And and it was uh it was it was dark. Those were dark years and ninth you know, so this this started in seventh grade, then eighth grade, and then ninth grade, and by the end of ninth grade I was done. I mean there was just the objective stance that every day was the new worst day of my life. And so from a very an emotional, logical place, I um, decided I was going to end my life. And I, I'd, I had been f- flirting with <laughs> with ministries. Like, there were people who'd invite me to um, a church or whatever, and I would go sometimes. And um, I, my, my older sister would go to church and she'd bring me with her and I'd sit in the back and read a book. And whenever someone tried to talk to me, <laughs> I, I remember have this, just throw this, up on that. No, but <laughs> kind <laughs> of, kind of a different kind of throw up. I remember this one guy specifically who was, who kept trying to like engage with me mm-hmm. at a youth group. And he, I remember this, this memory sticks out so well because I received it back so many times when I started working with youth. He was like, 
oh, that looks like a really cool book. What what is it? And I was like, it's a book. <laughs> and that was I was yeah, I went back to reading. I mean, like so maybe not, mm-hmm. maybe not um, actual vomit, but it was a vomit of the soul. I mean, I I I didn't know how to. I I was losing my humanity. Yeah. In it all. Um, but so anyways, summer after, after ninth grade, I sort of made the decision to end my life. And I, my, one of my last acts was going to be to go to a young life camp. Um, young life is a non-denominational, um, campus outreach. And I was, so I was going to go to the camp. I was going to hook up with this girl who was going, and then I was going to come back. And, uh, so that was the main reason. There was no sense of like, maybe I'll just give this one more shot. No, 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 no. This was not spiritual at all. Okay. Um, this was, there was a, a girl who I'd been talking to. She was a junior in high school. And, I, you know, there's there's some things that a, a ninth grade boy wants to experience before they end their own life. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we never ended up hooking up. Um but there, I, I did have a moment with the, the Young Life leader um, who, who took me up there and he did something for me that I felt, I don't think it happened in a long time or ever in my life. Mm. Uh, he listened to me. Oh. He listened to me when I told him that I hated him and he listened to me when I told him that I hated God and he would listen to me when I told him that I didn't believe in God. All of those things at the same time. And he helped me realize that I was angry. I was just so angry because my life didn't feel right. And that's that there's the gospel right there. None of our lives are right. It's it's wrong. It's just mine I think mine just felt felt especially wrong. I can see why. Yeah. And so that night it was that, you know, if, if any of, if anyone's ever been to a camp where like, there's that quiet night, I had that quiet night and that, and, um, I said some very unchurched things to God, uh, that, and that was actually a last ditch thing, but it sort of ended up in a business deal. Like, huh. Like I know what I'm, I know what I'm going to do. Like I know where I'm going with this in my life. I know what I'm going to do, Right. but I can't, I can't come back from that. So if you give me something better, then I won't do that. What a prayer. Yeah. Essentially that's what it was. So as unemotionally as I decided I was going to kill myself, I unemotionally gave my life to God and we'll come back to that unemotionally later because it fits into this whole thing. Okay. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. The first question that came to my head was this camp leader, was it very targeted? Like he went straight for this depressed, isolated kid. Did you think that at that time or, or look, even looking back now? No, I, I, I didn't think like he was, he was the leader that everyone wanted to be their leader. Okay. So honestly, my opinion was like, this dude doesn't want to spend any time with me. Like he should be like, he wants to be with the cool kids. Like, yeah, he's doing this because he has to, like he's having this conversation with me because he has to, uh, that was, I mean, now that I'm on the other side of things and I've, I've been the one to have these conversations, I can honestly say that, yes, he saw a kid who was desperate to be seen. Mm Mm-hmm. And he saw me and he heard me. And that was, that's all I needed. Yeah. I needed someone who loved Jesus to show me some of Jesus' character. What's next? So what's next is coming, you know, coming back home and telling all my non-Christian friends that I'm a Christian now. And oh, so this is a for real kind of like, after that, you you saw yourself as a Christian. Yeah. Oh, okay. No, I was like in. Oh, okay. Like, it was I was either all in or I was gonna kill myself. Right. And so, like, you can't go halfway on that on either of those deals. You know. What was the better thing that got offered then? 
Oh, yes. So, or is this well, related? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I'm, if I'm there quite yet. Okay, good, good, good. Because, like, when, so the the first thing is that when I came back, I was like, I, I told my friends that I, w- I was a Christian now, and they're mm-hmm. like, so they're, you're not fun anymore? <laughs> and I, I remember I was That's on a- AOL Instant Messenger, which <laughs> is, a, is an aging term. Um, and I remember typing back, like, I, I don't know, I guess not. Because... <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know. I didn't know. Yeah, yeah. I had no idea. Like, I had been around church stuff, but, like, church was a thing that you did to be a better member of society. Mm-hmm. Um, like a status. Yeah, yeah. It's a it's the right thing to do. Right. Um, so, but I, I didn't really know. Um, but what I discovered soon after, its purpose... So like, you have to understand that there was there was no miraculous healing. I came back like I, I was threw up a ton at the camp, and mm-hmm. and I came back and I was sick and and nothing changed. And here's the thing, there's there is a this is this is a belief system where there is a Christ on a cross. Mm-hmm. There is tremendous suffering all through the Bible. It is a book of suffering. And it's a book of, of suffering with purpose. It brought purpose and meaning to a life that, that was full of objective amounts of suffering. I'm curious what, other than, okay, I'm a Christian now, and you're at a point where you've been telling your friends that, was there any sense of like, dang it, God won, or I, I'm just curious how how much resistance you, you felt afterwards, or it, it was really a, it was really a sense of like, this is who I am now, and I can't really explain it. Uh, it was like both. <laughs> okay. Um, on, on the conscious level, it was, this is how, this is who I am now. Mm-hmm. On the subconscious level, there was a lot of resistance. There was okay. a lot of like lying to different groups of people. There was a lot of lying to myself. There was a lot of confusion who I was. Okay, so it's not just crystal clear. No, I mean, a... the the gift that God gave me was a gift of faith. Mm-hmm. I've never questioned. I I know this puts me on an outlier place, but I've never questioned my faith since. Hmm. I still, even sitting here on this red couch, I believe that God is and he is who he says he is more than I believe that I am sitting on this cow that has been true all the way okay where are we at in the timeline now so we are man there's a there's a mess of time uh, where I'm doing really good things like I'm I'm involved in ministry I'm I'm, uh, I did the junior high version of Young Life, um, where I, I was ministering to to junior high kids, and then I did did Young Life itself. I was ministering to high school kids, but I was also like having a really hard time managing my life. <laughs> like, aren't we all? Yeah, right. <laughs> but we aren't all getting kicked out of college. Oh, uh, this I, is a good one. I think. Yeah, I, I got kicked out of school my my uh freshman year um now you have to understand that so is we're at apu Uh for my freshman year i am really close with the campus pastor okay i a couple of my young life boys are the president of the university's nephews the dean of academics is a family friend I almost got kicked out after the first semester and all three of them stepped in and that that wasn't good enough for me to last the full year so I got kicked out of college well you you have to tell the story though because this has to do with like palm trees or something Mm, yes so I mean how many stories do I tell (laughs) at least one good one you can't can't leave us hanging alright we'll start with the first one Okay. So the school year hasn't even started yet. Um, so I'm not even a technically a college student yet. 
and I'm <laughs> hanging out with some sophomores at APU, and we're like deciding how we're gonna prank some other people, and we spend so long going back and forth over what we're gonna do that you know we're all drinking soda because we're in college, and that's what you do when you're in college: you just <laughs> drink a lot of a lot of liquids, and. <laughs> So we're like, we all need to pee. And so we pee in a bunch of Ziploc bags and put it on their doorstop. Okay. And then at about four in the morning that night, I get a knock on my dorm and uh, I had been caught. And so I had to do 15 hours of community service. Wow, that's so specific. I had to write a uh, three-page paper on the dangers of bio, biohazardous waste. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> and I got put on housing probation, which okay. meant that if I did anything else that was naughty, I would uh, get kicked out of housing. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so, so by the time I was finally asked to leave APU, I was on um, housing probation, uh-huh. chapel probation, uh, academic probation uh-huh. and student conduct probation, which means you... student conduct probation means y- we don't like you. You're not a good <laughs> we part. We really of, don't you're, like you. are really not a good part of this community. <laughs> so you're on probation. <laughs> Just throwing that in. There. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, that's there's there's funniness there, but um, it it's it was all symptomatic of like I, I didn't know what to do with it all there was still stuff I, I you know so many things I didn't understand about myself and God and how I fit in it all we we never really figured that out but I mean I I grew up really quick in some ways and I grew up really slow in some ways speaking to that first part I can even speak from my own experience like trauma or any kind of it doesn't even have to be sudden trauma, any kind of prolonged suffering. You mature, whether you want to or not. It just happens. And I wanted to rewind a little bit. Um, this was the question I was trying to think of. How did you view your health and your sickness after that camp when you mm-hmm. became a Christian? There, there's this weird church culture has a we- has some weird things about it. And so it kind of like made me cool in church culture. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Because everyone else like... Because oh, that was your thorn, right? Yeah, that was your Paul's thorn. Yeah, and it was it was a it was a really good one, <laughs> and I, no, but truly, so right. like, but at the same time, like, so like I'd tell this, I'd tell people about it, but at the same time, I, I felt completely isolated from every. Maybe digging more into your statement now, how does believing you're valued and loved? Why is that the first step? before you can love other people and then how do you know that and from your own life so you can love other people without loving yourself i think Mm. i think that is actually a a cultural uh misunderstanding okay um i think you are absolutely capable of loving like because that would mean that i wasn't loving the people i was ministering to and i biblically Mm. i was um, I mean, there's, there's years at, at, uh, at Western where, I mean, maybe every year at Western, maybe I went my whole time without really understanding this about myself, that it was really about everyone else and how much I could give them, but not because I had so much to give, but because I didn't matter. And so my interpretation of the gospel went was that I, you know, humility is making myself nothing Mm. so that I can love others sacrificially, perfectly. Um, So I don't matter. God matters and other people matter. But that is not, there is truth there. And that's, that's where the trickiest lies are. The trickiest lies are when there is good truth mixed in. Right, like half-truths. Yep. Hmm, well said. And so true love is sacrificial, period. It's not a, it's not a feeling feeling thing. That's not, that's not it. Hmm. At least not, not, not biblical. The, true, the truest truth, though, is that I'm, I'm made in the image of God. Hmm. Like, my image 
is God's image. And that is, that is a statement, an, an incomprehensible statement of value. So it's not just that you are made in the image of God, but I am too. Mm. And that is where my value comes from. And so I have, I have so much value that when I choose to sacrificially love someone else, I am elevating them even higher than that, than that incomprehensible amount of value that I already have. So it's not that I don't matter. I matter a tremendous amount. And my choice to love someone and elevate them is all the more impactful. Because if, if I'm a puddle of nothing on the floor and I elevate someone above me, what is that? It's nothing. Huh. Right, and, and especially because, I mean, whether you believe it or not, you have value. But when you believe it, I feel like people mm. can tell. And that is a huge part of it too. Yes. Yes, probably. Sometimes I feel like people aren't as insightful as we think they are. <laughs> um, and I mean that of all people, myself included. Um, it's, it's not just, a. I think the thing is that it's not about just other people. Like it's about me. This, this whole, this whole thing, this whole waking up and breathing and my heart beating thing like that's about me and God too, mm -hmm. removed from other people. That's not the that's not the only truth either, though. Right. Like, I'm not going to be go go live in isolation somewhere. Yeah. Otherwise, plenty of people do that, and then they'd be living that perfect life as a monk. Yes. And but but yeah, I I, I really like what you said that that like regardless of my perception of the value, my value is still there. Mm -hmm. Um, I just wasn't acknowledging it. The acknowledgement has put me in an entirely new place with my relationship with God though, because it wasn't a real relationship because I, I didn't on some level, I didn't trust him. I didn't trust that who, what he said about me was true. You, you mentioned a list of authors and um, musicians that influenced you. This is part of a bigger question. Uh, the bigger question is what practical things led you to change this mindset? But how would you how would you implement all of those authors? And yeah. I think one part you haven't mentioned is while you were sick, you read a ton. Hmm. And uh, I don't know if you enjoyed it or it was more like this is all I can really do. Maybe play video games, too. But how how does looking into the lives of other people who have gone before us and especially when you're in a place of suffering um, get you to a better place of viewing yourself? It's a good question. Yes, I did read a lot. Um, I've spent many nights awake in pain, and there's only so much, so many screens you can take. Mm -hmm, true. Um, I think it's crazy. It's a tangent that you can feel free to cut out, but uh -huh. I think it's, I think it's crazy how much time people spend on screens. Like, I know that sounds old, but you, you got to <laughs> understand that, like. I spent a crazy amount of time on screens because I literally was too sick to move. Right. And that's, I'm like, I don't think I would hit average now. Like, <laughs> I'm not even kidding. Yeah. It's really weird to me because I'm a full on like recovered slash recovering screen addict. Uh -huh. Like not a phone, but like, like video games, like just losing myself because my reality was so terrible. I don't understand why so many people want to lose themselves like how terrible can everyone's reality really be? Or have we just made these fake realities so delicious that we can't anyways? No, I like this. Uh, and I will add to that statement or I guess modify it to, I think people just don't realize how good reality is. Oh, that's so good. It's so true. They so true. Reality is so good. Nature is so good. Um, music that that you're not like aggressively controlling and right. playing the same song over and over but like real life music and and one-on-one -on -one conversations it's all so good yes you're right okay so reading 
I read a ton. Uh, the first author I put when you asked me was Tolkien and specifically the Lord of the Rings. And if I had to put a, a movie, I would put the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, like, you just you just don't get the journey. Here's um, the English teacher coming out. Of course, absolutely. You don't get the journey. Yeah. If you don't go through the journey, you can't have the catharsis, the emotional release that comes from experiencing that journey. So sure, if you if you marathon all three extended edition, edition Lord of the Rings, you go on a journey, and if you do it in one day, but that's too much screen. That's too much screen, exactly. <laughs> but even when people want to read Lord of the Rings, I warn them like just get through the first hundred fifty pages, and then you'll in, like you'll start enjoying it. Mm -hmm. Like that's a big ask, but you don't get the beauty of those character arcs so, if you don't go through that journey and that's my story right isn't it mm. the beauty of my character arc is in the journey if i if if you simmer down 15 years of illness to a few snapshots there's no journey there you don't know what it's like um it's only it's only my own experience in all of those in all of that pain right it's my own ring journey it's there's the the beauty of of watching um frodo go through his journey with the ram and how it's it's just the humble act of the weakest that saves the world and the beauty of that story is that he doesn't even do it he's a little <laughs> failure it's gollum when he bites the ring off frodo's finger and then dies he, that's the one who saves the world frodo right. was going to ruin it and then there's this beautiful line. If you're, if you only want to watch the movie, you can still see it, um, where he comes back to the Shire and he says, "The Shire has been saved, but not for me. Hmm. The journey was it was too much. He can't return to to the peace of his home anymore. He has to go somewhere else." And I I really resonate with that. There was there was this version of Eric who was outgoing and and popular and easy with conversation i'm not i i will never be that person again and there's as you know you might be able to see there's some tears welling up like there's a sadness there there's a mourning there but i i don't i don't wish that i wasn't me too if that makes sense uh, my illness has made me very deep mm -hmm. and very dark i'm a melancholy um, you're a donkey yeah i'm a donkey <laughs> oh, i'm um, sorry eeyore i thought that was yeah no yeah not shrek i'm no. winnie the pooh winnie the pooh eeyore um i i don't i don't often say negative things because there's a lot of it inside i don't i used to think that that was bad and a part of my current journey is realizing that it's not bad i i have i have of special insight into um, the tension of existing in a fallen world. Right. I, that that's what it is. It's not a bad thing. Is it fun? No, it's not fun, but it's not bad. I really resonate with that, and I'll tell a little bit of what I've been going through because I don't know if you experienced this, but I have so many moments in my life of. I guess you could call it regret of, oh, maybe I took that conversation way too deep. Mm -hmm. And you're just rethinking a party that you went to or a church gathering. And the, all the person asked was, you know, where'd you get those shoes? And then you you end up talking about like your family history and, and your emotions. And then you go home that night and you think, damn it, why did I talk about all that? You know, I should have just answered like where I got the shoes. Um, and what I'm learning is that there is value in that and people think about it. And it's I think it's in that moment realizing, and I think this goes back to the value of whatever came out, that deepness, that darkness, it was because I've been on this struggle and this journey and I'm realizing my value. Mm -hmm. And so my, you know, I have to fight it, but I have to go back to, I don't regret having that deep conversation with that person. If they thought it was weird, they thought it was weird, but you know, I, I get to live my life in such a way that if I died today, like I ended with like a very real sincere conversation. 
Um, and, you know, you've always struck me as that kind of person. Um, I don't know. I guess my question would be, you know, how do you deal with that kind of, do you feel that kind of regret? Or you think you're at a point where, like, you, you own who you are mm. in all of the melancholiness and the moments of, like, why didn't Eric just talk about his depression when I asked him how his day was? Um, when I was, this was slightly before I went to Western. I was just coming out of a really long abusive relationship the, as the ab- abused, um, you have to say that when you're coming out of a, you say that you're coming out of an abusive relationship. <laughs> um, and I went to therapy in the in the set so i'm i'm in my mid late 20s okay late 20s and i'm talking with the counselor and i'm telling him about how every morning i plan every interaction that i'm going to have and all of the possibilities of how that interaction could go and he said that that's not a good idea Uh and i had no idea that you know this is kind of connected it's a protection against the vulnerability that comes with Mm. melancholy the the thing that i I, it doesn't bother me that i'm low that i'm on the lower end of this you know i'm i'm the opposite of bubbly like that doesn't (laughs) that doesn't bother me i do own that that is who part of who i am right and in short it it doesn't bother me that a conversation may be uncomfortable for someone (laughs) um I mean that I sort of love that about you know teaching and 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 being involved in that many lives. When you're that, a teacher, they gotta listen. Exactly, <laughs> a literal captive audience. This was a few questions back, but the more practical things that got you kind of climbing out of this out of this ditch. Mm-hmm. Um, you talked about Tolkien. You talked about Lord of the Rings. Um, what are some other? Uh, yeah, well, there's some other influences, and people mm. that way people can even look them up. And oh man, I have so many. <laughs> so uh, I actually taught Dante. Um, this... Please don't quiz me. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> that was the that was my opener. That was my opener for you guys. That was the first thing we did. Oh, we... the first book you yeah. covered. Yeah, yeah. Um, Dante opens up with talking about how he's lost on the road midway through life's journey, and. Historically, um, in medieval Italy, a life expect- expectancy was se- was seventy years, and so mm-hmm. it's assumed he was thirty five in exile when he wrote this. I remember this part. Yep. I go back to that one opening line so many times because I think this is my midway through life's journey moment where I'm lost on on, and I think the beauty of that line is not the fact that you can trace it historically to oh. Well, historically, they were 70, and so he must have been 30. That's not that's not the beauty. The beauty of it is that we always get lost midway through life's journey. We don't know what life's journey, how long life's journey is. Mm-hmm. That that original thing, that's what you'd put on an English quiz. Right. But what you put on your life is that we get lost on life's journey. And there are paths and they look scary. There are paths that are blocked by beasts. You know, the thing that sends him down into hell is because he's too afraid to go on the paths that lead up to heaven. Kind of reminds me of what we're just talking about, about reality. Mm. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes, exactly. Which is another book, C.S. Lewis, uh, Great Divorce, Mm. um, where the, the main character, he visits hell and he visits heaven, um, very different view of hell than Dante. It's a view of hell that, like, you just keep becoming the person you're becoming forever. And so, like, <laughs> C.S. Lewis in, in a different book, Mere Christianity, puts it this way. Like, if you think you have anger problems now as right. a 25-year-old, and then they get worse when you're 75, what about when you're 1 million years old? How will your anger issues be? I mean, you'll physically be anger. Yeah, right? At that point. You will become a wretched being of pure hatred, almost no matter what your flaw is. Mm. And so that's Lewis's version of hell he puts forth. But the version of heaven is that it's so real that it hurts. 
Yeah. Like he steps on the grass and it's like so real that he can't handle it. Yeah. And that's, you know, I, I think that's so beautiful. Both of those pictures I find to be so beautiful. And I think that's what even the tangent that we went on with screens, mm. how that can relate is I don't think it's so much uh, the whole teenagers just don't want to go outside. And mm. it's this fear of like, oh, my gosh, there's actually something better out there. I'm more familiar with what mm. I've settled with here. Mm. And gosh, I've fallen prey to that so many times. We all do. Not just with I refuse to go out and play soccer, but with this relationship i'm fine if it's just here mm. i'm fine if uh we're not moving anywhere because at least i know the state we're in right now i don't know what it's like to quote unquote have something better than it, than this right here mm. that's good to hear more about eric and what ended up happening to him because everyone's itching to know you obviously aren't sick now yeah um what happened mm. So this is where it gets kind of tricky in the story. And you sort of, like, and up until now, you can decide, like, you, you can just think it's a good story and you don't have to believe anything about Jesus. Okay. But this is where I lose people. So I had been doing, uh, working with youth because, I mean, my young life leader, he, he essentially laid the path for what I was going to do. Like, I was going to find the... The other Eric's. The other Eric's. Absolutely. And so I had been finding other Eric's for a while. <laughs> um, and I was leading a small group of young men, a couple of sophomores and a couple of seniors. And I didn't show up one day to our meeting uh, because I was sick. And they came to my house and they prayed over me and then they left. And it was, it was a, it was, man, it was a prayer. Like the, the guy who um, who was really like leading it, like yeah. he believed it. He believed that I was going to be healed. He wept, and they laughed, and I was still sick. And uh, but I, I was, you know, I was like, wow, what what a great small group leader they must have. <laughs> I've um, them well, yeah. Um, and then the next day, I was driving somewhere, and I, it just like hit me. Do I want to? do I want to be healed? And I was like, yeah. And I'm, I'm not saying this is the voice of God. You know, people throw that around so flippantly. Right. Like, oh, I talked to God in the shower. I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> like this, but I knew the choice was mine. I had a choice to, because you see, and the, you know, the ironic thing is you see it like all through scripture, but it was so foreign to me. Like Jesus is asking people constantly. Yeah. You don't apply that to yourself. Yeah. You don't right? think that. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I was like, yeah. And then I was healed and that was it. I was done. I mean, describe like the elation or like the, not many people have a moment like this. Yeah. So the elation looked like a, almost a full year of, of deep, deep depression. Huh? You you have got to you've got to know that I spent so many times fantasizing about when I was gonna like if I was healed because I'd been prayed over many 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 times yeah. and I fantasized and I fantasized about I'll pick up my mat I'm gonna tell everyone I <laughs> tell all my friends they'll be like oh my gosh I believe in Jesus now too um, but without without my illness who was I mm. I mean this it had been my closest companion. So how many years? 15 years, two months, and uh, 18 days. Okay. Yeah, so um, I, I, I expected elation, and what I found was depression. Um, some of the stuff that, that had been happening behind the scenes was bubbling up. Mm. Um, and so that was, that was enough, that was my first real like I I'd, I'd already referenced it but that was my first real Dante moment cuz I you know at that point I I I was well on my way to becoming a teacher in in faith because I I could have never been in a classroom full time with with my condition wow. is it just a very simple like this character felt this way so I can relate or maybe even just because you're a literature guy 
just the beauty of of how it was expressed you're like this is finally something that is expressing what i've what i feel right now um i i find like bits and pieces like i think of uh crime and punishment um the main character he when he's alone and not connected with family he he talks himself into you know spoilers he talks himself into killing someone like he talks himself into thinking that he's like napoleon Mm -hmm. and therefore he has a right because he's stronger to take another life but the second that he is finds connectedness he can't do that anymore because he's he's now has his humanity back because he sees it mirrored in other people i can relate with that yeah. how dark things get when you're isolated mm. scarlet letter the public disgrace is so much more holy than the private sin that you hold in oh i don't relate with the whole story but there are these chunks of truth that when you grab them from all these places and you can put them together um it's a beautiful mosaic right this is something i've asked my guests especially if their story is one of going through suffering okay you're talking to either it be 14 year old you or another 14 year old i mean you've done this what are your words or maybe not even any words to that kid um, that's that's listening to this and can relate or uh, at the very least relate to being angry at God or being sick I I feel like I should have words for the people in their life too <laughs> so I would first have words with the people in that person's life mm. and I would let them know to communicate value to this person to tell them that they are a valuable human being that they no matter what they're doing what they're accomplishing or not accomplishing that it doesn't really matter they're a valuable human being it took me like 35 years to really understand that i was a valuable human being i mean first off don't kill yourself right like don't kill yourself like if my if my testimony points to one thing that's undeniable just don't kill yourself I, I, I have a real, I have a life that I like a lot Mm -hmm. now. And not only is it just selfish, not only do I like it selfishly, but a lot of objective good has come out of me living. I like that because it's not just a statement of, you know, I, I never would have experienced the blessings of life, which is true, but just in a cosmic sense good has come out of your life and you as a person and I'm a witness to that because you didn't follow through right right exactly Um, so that would be the first thing and then the second thing would be to just be honest like you you hate God be honest you want to tell him some really nasty things you tell him some really nasty things Mm -hmm. and so chances are if you hate God or you're pissed at him that one he can take it but also you probably don't know him you hmm. probably pissed at someone else or yourself right and those are okay too yeah that takes time yeah yeah it does one of the reasons i started this was because i started on this journey of i'm rethinking so much right and sure. My college campus minister, I remember I was driving in the car with him one time, and I don't know why this question popped into my head, but I asked him, how old were the disciples? Uh, He, I think he estimated like early 20s or mid 20s. um, And Jesus was, you know, in his early 30s. Uh, And I've always wondered whether that's supposed to be significant, that 10 year gap. Obviously, anyone older than you or younger than you can impart wisdom to you. But maybe there's something about that 10 year gap that God knew Jesus could really influence the disciples at the age he is, at the age they are at. I mean, so you're Jesus right now. (laughs) But, you know, so this this podcast is really a result of that wrestling and thinking and desiring mentorship and realizing that other people my age are seeking that whether they realize it or not. 
um, what do you have, what advice or wisdom do you have just for people at Peter and John and John's age? Honestly, seek it. Like if, if you, if you are hungry for a mentorship and you should be, then f- seek it, mm. make it happen. During, during the lockdown, I had a really tough time because <laughs> I, I had a lot of emotional <clears throat> stuff going on that I didn't understand and all of my safety nets were taken from me. Church community was taken from me. My job, which yeah. like, you got to understand, I, I mean, I spent my whole life being sick and then I was healed and like within a year I'm working at Western. So like it really did, it was like part of this new life and I, I loved it and I was good at it. It was, it was me, all cylinders. And now I'm teaching through a screen and none of my students care. They just look at me and it's disheartening every day. And I remember going to my pastor, who was somewhat of a mentor of mine, and I, I said, like, I don't, I don't know how to do it. Like, I don't know how to do life this way um, in a way that's not just, like, barely surviving. Mm. And he said, do you feel desperate? And I was like, yes. He's like, prove it. Huh. And I, was, I, I made the exact same face that you just made. <laughs> and he said, if you say you're desperate, but you're doing all the same things every day, if you're actually desperate, do something desperate. He said, go pay for a hotel room and only pray for t- 24 hours. Go on, go to the mountains, stay up all night fasting and praying. Like essentially like things you hear about. Right. But you don't do because you don't want to prove that you're desperate enough. And so the next day, I I went to the mountains for like four hours. And then I was going home and I was like, I'm still desperate. And so I drove to the beach for the rest of the day. Thank God for California. I, amen. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I went to the mountains and I went to the beach same day. Um, but... I mean, that's, that's what desperate people do. They go searching, right? And so I went searching and I found, and was it all better? No, I was really, I mean, I don't know if anyone can realize, but it was a really hard year. Mm. We're going to be processing it in ourselves for, for a while. And we're, we're going to hold some of this. And so if you, if you, I mean, if you truly want things to change then get desperate, if you want, if you like, are like looking at your life and you're like, I'm not okay, or I'm not okay with this thing, get desperate. Demand, demand satisfaction. <laughs> go to go to someone you respect and admire, who you, someone you want to be in ten years, and tell them, hey, you're gonna be my mentor. Mm-hmm. I am. Um, so there's, I, I have to, I have to name drop one more author okay. before before we end. Makoto Fujimura, he is just this tremendous person of of God, and he's an artist first, but he's also become a writer, and he wrote this book recently called Art and Faith. In it, he um, rephrases um, that verse from Ephesians, where we are God's uh, workmanship, and he rephrases it as masterpiece, um, that we are God's masterpiece which if you are creating Mm -hmm. if you're creating like we think workmanship and because we're american we think usefulness Hmm, good point but that's not like we're we're looking at a carpenter and a tent maker paul wrote the words and he was writing them about jesus a carpenter's workmanship is not utilitarian necessarily it's also beauty and and innate value and so it's it's that 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 there's this innate value just in existing i have been made valuable by my image and then elevated by the price of the cross it's a beautiful thing but but you have you 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 can't fully get it until you acknowledge 
um, the value that you have, the, the masterpiece that you are. You know, I have a, I have mentors for like personal life, but he's sort of been a creative mentor for me as I, as I enter this, this new stage where I am not teaching and spending a lot of time writing and a lot more time trying to write. And it's so vulnerable and scary and no one's paying me. <laughs> and it's just something I'm That's doing. the scariest of all. It is. <laughs> talk about like worth, you know, oh, how man. much worth do we get when we get a paycheck? It's embarrassing. It's honestly embarrassing. I'm embarrassed at myself when I think about how much less worth I feel when I'm writing versus when I would like have my worst day at school where I'm like completely turned off as if I'm, I'm a better human being because I'm existing in a location and getting paid than if I'm plowing through my soul and connecting deeply with God and allowing him to use me to worship him through putting words on a page. Any final words or quips? Am I equipped for this? <laughs> is, that a, is that a quip? <laughs> that was a quick quip. I'll, I'll end it at that right there. I'll just okay. cut it as soon as you said Excellent. quip for this. Um, well, I do have one last thing. Okay. Actually, I, I am learning about how much we were made in the image of a creator and how important it is that we too create. Oh, this is a whole nother episode, man. Wow. Uh, it could be, but I, I am in love with this idea. Mm. And it's, I mean, there are times when I'm truly connected and I'm writing and it's pure worship in yeah. the way that the most connected I, and you know, you know how connected I am with musical worship, Yeah, but it, it is just as, just as close. And, you know, you look at you look at the people of the Bible, David, Jesus. I mean, even the 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 disciples, like it's all it's all create a creating of something. Mm -hmm. Um, and there there is a lot of beauty there. So I don't know if you can. This might have just been for you, but man, I would encourage anyone out there who who can to connect with with creating in worship it's a beautiful thing that's that's editing for me seriously mm, like editing yeah, this podcast beautiful. um i spend an unnecessary amount of time on it and I, ad I admit some of it is my perfectionism but uh you i mean you brought up how you know a lot of this podcast is for me selfishly to meet up with my former english teacher to meet up with friends but through this exactly what you've you're describing like I know I will create this and I have that feeling of pride when I publish it but also as I'm editing mm -hmm. God edits all the time and it's I, I'm literally in doing exactly what his nature is and that that's that's actually the the beautiful point that that the editing like it's not the hitting submit or whatever you do <laughs> upload um it's because because that's that's the result Right. That's not the creating. Mm. That's the result. Like, and that's that's so much of what everyone else is about. Like, with with what what's the result? Yeah. But that's not where the worship is. The worship is in the process. The process. Um, and that's that's I mean that's scripture all the way through. The process of God's people. The process of sanctification. Yeah. The, and then the process that we go through in our own lives, even the character arcs that we were talking about, my process in my own life, in the creating is where the worship can happen. So I love that you said that, that the editing where you're by yourself, just doing the process. Yeah. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Well, thank you for giving me a lot to edit. You're very welcome. I'm <laughs> happy to fill the air. 